Welcome to my latest manifesto review, 2020 for Britain manifesto. Uh, and as all the other sections, we're getting through them. Uh, as with all the other sections, I'll do, uh, I'll take you through the uh, policy on the manifesto, a blog and a, a audio reading of it. So please do share these. They're on forbritain.uk slash manifesto. So today I'm going to be looking at uh, an area that is of particular interest to me because I am in fact a politics geek uh, and I'm sure many of you are. So today I'm going to talk about our policy on government and what that means is how we are governed, policy on how we are governed. So as, as with the other videos I'll take you, I'll have a read through uh, and add I guess a little bit more uh, information on it. So to start, the way the UK is governed must change. Well, I think most of us would agree with that. Most of us would agree with this part as well. The behaviour of MPs following the Brexit referendum result has revealed to the public a widespread disregard for in Parliament for the voice of the British people. Now, uh, it is quite. It was quite shocking the rhetoric from the MPs prior to the referendum and the rhetoric immediately afterwards. It was Orwellian. So beforehand, they were saying to us, if we come out, that's it. If you vote to leave, that's it. We're out. Customs Union, uh, Common Market, ECJ, the whole shebang, we're out. Be careful. Uh, of course, we were out when they were trying to get us not to vote to leave. As soon as we voted to leave, oh, well, we never said we would leave the customs union. We never said we'd leave the common market. I mean, come on, that wasn't what people voted for. There was suddenly a hard Brexit and a soft Brexit. Now, what that tells me very clearly is that the political elite did not want the result. That's quite obvious. Uh, but they were also so, so content, are they, that people will go out and vote them back in again, uh, that they feel no qualms about completely uh, betraying what they said they would do. Um, and there's a, this, it, it showed uh, in the public, uh, public dialogue, I guess, the media politics, um, that there's a disdain for democracy. And, and by democracy, well, this element of democracy, majority wins. They don't like that. They don't agree with the majority. So my question on that is, if the majority doesn't decide things, then who does? And on what grounds? Now, the people who told us that we, we didn't know what we were voting for, etc., they believe they should make decisions because they are more knowledgeable. They are, in other words, superior to the voting British public. Uh, they really want to be able to make the rules without answering to anyone. Uh, I, that's a personality type I don't particularly like. Um, so, if, you know, next time you, you, you meet a, a Remainer who's still rabbiting on, ask them who gets to decide if not the majority and upon what criteria. Furthermore, Insidious laws on hate have led to the strangulation of free speech and a population frightened to express an honest opinion for fear of risking job loss or arrest. We all know this. We all know this is true. Um, <clears throat> we probably know someone this has happened to, and I know there are members of For Britain that this has happened to. Uh, they've either been uh, feared losing their job, or they jumped before they were pushed, or they had their desk cleaned out. Um, by their employers and uh, prior to being called for the first meeting to discuss it. Uh, and of course, we have Damien Ryan, a teacher who's on uh, suspension and they're trying, the Teaching Regulation Authority is trying to um, ban him from teaching altogether. And I'll give you more information on that particular case, actually, uh, when we when it is resolved. We're at the tribunal for that in March. And I'll keep you, I'll update you beforehand during and after that. So it's happening in the middle of March. For Britain believes in the fundamental democratic rights of all British people. We therefore seek the implementation of a UK constitution designed to protect the rights and freedoms of citizens from the whim of parliamentarians. Members of Parliament, both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, should not have the ability to remove or infringe upon the fundamental rights of British people. Now, no one is saying this is going to be easy. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Uh, but with this proposal, with this policy, we're starting, you know, we're, we're putting down uh, a firm idea of how to not allow MPs 
to take away our fundamental rights. Uh, and I think this is vitally important. And the idea that we hold them to account every few years in a general election, of course, this is true. Um, but they have ability to make laws to hamper, uh, to, to, to dampen down the democratic process to, for example, a removal of our freedom of speech. So we're not actually holding free and fair elections. We're holding elections uh, within the prism set by parliamentarians and we're only allowed to discuss things as determined by parliamentarians. This is not a free and democratic society. So the hate speech laws are a perfect example of something that we shouldn't, our MPs shouldn't be able to pass because it infringes upon our freedom of speech and therefore our right to truly hold them to account. Now a, an actual written constitution has issues, there are laws and conventions that uh, would have to be looked at uh, such as uh, the, the um, that Parliament can't bind its successor. That's a difficult one. I think any any UK constitution would have to be uh, with serious uh, consultation and serious partnership with the Queen. Um, but it can, it absolutely can be done. Believe you can do these things and you can. So, to continue, the Human Rights Act, ostensibly intended to protect our rights, is not fit for a purpose and has instead become a protector of foreign criminals and terrorists who ought to be removed from the United Kingdom. You know, I don't think that's um, inflammatory. I think that's absolutely true. The Human Rights Act uh, guarantees our right to free expression but didn't stop MPs passing hate speech laws. Um, what it has done, this uh, right to a family life stuff, for example, has been interpreted beyond all reasonableness uh, to include um, keeping uh, terrorists, rapists uh, in our country uh, at, you know, with, with no regard for the danger and the threat they pose to the decent law abiding British people. That is not uh, a human rights that act that is protecting us, quite the opposite. So it's not fit for purpose. It has to go. British citizens currently have no means to hold to account those in uh, power, such as senior police, the NHS, the CPS or local government executives. Now, local government councillors are, of course, elected, but executives are not. They are highly paid and they are not answerable to the public. Same for chief executives of hospitals, same for senior police, same for leaders of the Crown Prosecution Service. Now, we believe that we must have an ability to bring these people, to get these people uh, fired from their jobs if necessary. If you look at senior police across Rotherham, Rochdale, etc., etc., they weren't punished for what happened. Uh, we need, And they would have been. They would have been had the people had an ability to punish them. We must, you know, we don't, we don't have this cronyism among the elites in the public sector where they all look after each other uh, and instead of getting fired, they'll be moved to an equally lucrative job somewhere else to silence the criticism. No, the public is paying for these people. It's the public who should hold them to account. We must deliver hands for Britain believes this must be changed and power must be delivered back to the hands of the people. For Britain believes in our union. We believe in the United Kingdom and we believe that our uh, union must be celebrated in popular culture. We support and encourage the unity of the peoples and cultures of the British Isles. For Britain further believes that the first past the post system used to elect members of the House of Commons is past its sell by date and not fit for purpose. A two party state is not a healthy democracy. I think it's fairly self explanatory that uh, we have ended up with a situation where people um, are voting for Labour to keep the Tories out or Tories are voting uh, or, or vice versa. Um, this is not healthy and there isn't, you know, smaller parties really struggle to break through under this system. Um, it has to go. It has to go. It's past its, its sell by date. Electoral fraud is a major and unnecessary flaw in the democratic process. The Electoral Commission admitted in 2017 that there were quote unquote troubling reports of up to a thousand instances of double voting, uh, what it sounds like, person, same person voting twice uh, in that year's general election. In some areas, such as Tower Hamlets in London, voter fraud has been overlooked by authorities. Gosh, I wonder why. Uh, a situation described by former Communities Minister Eric Pickles as astonishing. In 2019, questions were raised surrounding the legitimacy of the result 
of a parliamentary by-election in the city of Peterborough. Now, I made a couple of videos about that at the time, which I will link to below. Such incidents must not continue, and the British people must be able to have faith in the electoral process. Um, faith in the electoral process has pretty much gone. I was talking about this um, with uh, Mike Speakman a couple of days back, and he was saying that there used to be true. The police used to um, escort the uh, boxes the uh, uh, from the polling station to be counted. That no longer happens. And we know full well that particularly Labour, particularly regarding postal voting, we know that they are stealing elections. It is absolutely reprehensible and disgusting and it must stop. A further element of the British political order that needs urgent reform is the House of Lords. While it serves a primary purpose in the scrutiny of legislation and the holding of government to account, it is arguably too large and too expensive and its membership too wide. The estimated cost of each member of the approximately 900 strong House of Lords is 83,000 per year. Now, that's a lot of money. Um, we had a... a vote on this uh, in the party, a policy vote, uh, which we hold every year. And the members voted between abolishing the House of Lords or reforming the House of Lords. The members voted in the majority to reform the House of Lords. Um, I was probably quite pleased with that result. I've had a lot of experience with the House of Lords and I know and I have absolute sympathy with, with both sides of the abolish uh, argument. Um, but I have a great deal of experience of the House of Lords and what I will say from my experience is that members of the Lords are far braver, far more likely to get involved in controversial things. Um, and if we had an elected House of Lords, we would just have another, uh, another House of Commons. In other words, another load of professional politicians, smarmy, polished, professional politicians who will say any bloody thing to win votes. We don't need a second House like that. One is quite enough. Um, but I do think how people get into the House of Lords should absolutely be reformed and how much it costs. And, it, and as I say, that's what our members voted for. So finally, local government is a driving force of the towns and cities that people live in. And as such, it has the power to influence major aspects of everyday life. Um, local government has a, really got a lot of power. Uh, it determines things like schools, uh, you know, it, 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 your daily life, traffic, taxes so, you know it, it, really really important really important things uh, and actually members of parliament have very little say in these crucial day-to-day -day, uh areas of our life so and which in which lo local government holds sway so it's not you know that people i'm asking people to step forward and stand for local government this year it's not a minor office to hold it's a very very important um very important in our in our everyday lives and very very powerful so for britain is concerned about waste in local government as we are across the public sector and it's our fundamental belief that in fact we ought to be reducing expenditure and taxation but by targeting waste and not by targeting services uh, this applies also to policing the nhs the cps and other major public sector bodies far too frequently police chiefs local government officials officials and NHS executives fail in their basic duty and are not easily accountable to the public. So how do we, what do we do about this? Here comes the bullet points. One, scrap the Human Rights Act and replace it with a UK constitution and a public sector accountability act to enable citizens to hold public sector leaders to account. So how I would envisage a UK constitution working is similar to how it works in the United States. Uh, it is, people can uh, go to court and, and challenge either uh, any part of the public sector or a government policy or a government uh, legislation uh, as to whether or not it is compatible with the UK constitution. If it's not, it's struck down, just similar to the United States. Public Sector Accountability Act would allow people to, uh, and not to be prohibitively expensive, this is really important, would allow people to approach the same court uh, on the record of a senior official who is receiving lots of public money but not actually doing their job. They would be taken uh, to the same court and the ultimate pe price they can pay is loss of their job. And you only have to lose a few people from those roles for everyone else to start pulling their socks up. You will change the public sector culture if this happens and if it works. Abandon the first-past-the-post electoral system. 
reform the House of Lords and introduce appointments criteria to ensure that those appointed are able to show achievement and contribution to business, politics, charity or other relevant areas. And I think this is really important because any Tom, Dick or Harry can be put into the House of Lords upon the whim uh, of a Prime Minister. Um, and I don't think that's right. I think they must be able to show that they have uh, something to add to the debate around legislation. So experienced business people, for example, experienced uh, people who've achieved things in, in public life. And I think there should be a criteria for that. So ensure that only British citizens can vote in general elections and that those who vote in any election produce valid identity. Absolutely clear as day. Absolutely essential. Ensure all steps are taken to prevent double voting. Any electoral fraud should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Once again, it's because people are getting away with this that it keeps happening. If you put in, if you put a stop to it, if you jail a few people for it, it will change. End postal voting for all except those who are out of the UK at the time of the election and those clearly unable to attend a polling station on account of disability. Now, it can't be a disability um, such as... Um, Depression, for example, I'm not downgrading depression. I'm simply saying that it doesn't physically stop a person from getting to a polling station. You have to be physically unable to get there. Now, this one's controversial, but it was voted on by the members uh, who uh, voted for us to, uh, between uh, lowering it, keeping it the same and rising it, and people voted to raise it. Rates the voting age to 21. I actually think um, that this is... I don't think it's a slippery slope towards a qualifying people. There's an age to vote. I'm simply saying that 18 is very young now. It's a lot younger than it used to be. Uh, and I've no problem with that, actually. They say 40 is the new 30. That's fine by me. Um, but adult life does not begin at 18. Many people are still in school at 18, not paying for anything at 18. 21, they're far more likely to be independent and to know the value of the pound in their pocket. And to be, have a few years away from, in some cases, not all, from the propaganda in schools. Introduce referenda in local areas so that people can vote upon any major construction or major change in their locality. Now, we can't be having votes every five minutes. So this needs uh, a little bit of, of, of fleshing out. We would need a certain target to be reached. Uh, for example, a number of houses to be built uh, or a, a significant element of a construction that will fundamentally change the local area. We can't be having votes every five minutes. People won't participate. So there's got to be criteria in there to make it uh, worth so it makes such a fundamental change to a people's lo to people's local area. So we're talking about talk changing a small village, for example, into not a small village. So it completely changes the character of the area. On those instances, I think people should have a vote on whether or not it takes place. Prioritise public spending to ensure that all children, all children can attend a school rated at least good by Ofsted. We will set this target and follow through. I think it's fairly self-explanatory, a good education. I think it's shocking, actually, that kids are going to schools um, which are, are, are below par, below, below uh, any, any kind of ex uh, acceptable standard. It's quite shocking and shouldn't be happening. Ensure that local people are prioritised in the allocation of social and affordable housing. Again, that's quite clear. Uh, we shouldn't be bringing people in from the other side of the world uh, and giving them priority because their families are huge and they are getting priority because their families are huge. And you'll have local people, a uh, local single mum, for example, who's been sitting on the housing list for a, a, a terrifically long time and in comes um, the eight kid family from Somalia and takes, I'm sorry, I don't, you know, I, 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 some people may think that's crass, but it's true. Install CCTV in polling stations. Now, I'm not a big per a big fan of CCTV, to be quite honest with you. I don't think it works in a great number of um, instances. Um, but it does work. It would, in this instance, work as a deterrent for, for voting fraud and for counting fraud. I don't think there's a great deal of counting fraud. I think it the, most of the fraud happens at postal vote level. Uh, and in double voting. So I don't think there's a great deal of fraud at, at the counts. But why not? Make sure we are watching this and allow candidates, or better yet, the police. Uh, this isn't in the policy, but it will be next year. Better yet, the police to escort the transport of ballot boxes from polling stations to their destination for count, but absolutely allow candidates to follow uh, every step of the way or a representative for, for the candidate to follow every step of the way from the closing of that ballot box, the transport of that ballot box to the count of what's in that ballot box. We don't trust 
uh, the electoral system as it is. Uh, and I think it's very important for, for candidates, particularly candidates from parties like our own, um, to have the ability to make sure that things are being done correctly. Perform physical checks on houses where a high number of people are registered to vote. Now, we know of instances of this, 20, 25 people in one house, all of them voting for Labour. <laughs> we've got to stop and we've got to check on these. We've got to send the police out to, and I, I understand we need more police, but it's our policy to have a lot more police. Uh, send the police out to houses where a lot of people are registered to vote and check who these people are. Again, you only need to do this a few times before the message spreads. Lastly, and this is a pleasant one, and I always like to end on a positive note, introduce public holidays to celebrate all nations across the UK. That is, the whole of the UK will enjoy a public holiday on St George's Day, St Andrew's Day, St David's Day and St Patrick's Day. Um, so there we have it. Those are our policies on government. They, we all know that the, we have these problems. We know, uh, and Brexit has pulled back the curtain on a lot of the problems we have with our, govern, our governance we know that we need to change this. And I think this policy covers a pretty much, uh, certainly all the major aspects of what's wrong in how we are governed today. Uh, and it gives a lot of power back to the voting citizen. Uh, and that's exactly the, the entire ethos of our party, is to empower the citizen. If you agree, uh, if you like what you hear in this policy, share it, get people on board uh, and join us. Uh, these are the policies that the country is crying out for and we will get that message to the public uh, and we will do it again in May uh, where we will get some more uh, councillors in seats. Do join us.